Hey, Dano. Hello. I was checking to make sure I had the time right. So I was the only person on. <laughs> yeah, we're just running a little long on the show and tell. Folks will show up here shortly. I think this is going to be a fairly quick one. There's not, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, items that anybody added to the contributor call that I saw last last modification. I'll refresh and make sure. I probably should have added my stuff, but I was taking the weekend off finally. Okay. Good. 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 Hello, Hi, everyone. So here's the uh, antitrust policy. Everybody review the antitrust policy at your leisure. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. Please mute unless you're speaking. And if you have a question, use the raise hand feature. Um, so general announcements. Um, I don't know if this is really a general announcement, but more of something that I was hoping we could get some resolution on uh, today is um, what we want to do about the GitHub runner limits that Hyperledger has run into. Um, I think GitHub has started enforcing runner limits that they previously didn't. And in order to get um, a log jam of runner utilization cleared, uh, what, what we've had to do in a, in a variety of different uh, projects in Hyperledger is to have self-hosted runners. And we have currently consensus has five um, AMD 64, um, basically EC2 instances that are kind of augmenting the build load. Um, and then when uh, Rai has also uh, clued us in that there's also the ARM 64 runners and so forth. This really, this only affects the GitHub actions and stuff. So this is more CI stuff, but this time it's not Circle CI. And um, I don't really know what the cost associated with uh, the runner limits, you know, upgrading the GitHub plan versus the cost of just providing uh, basically specific uh, runners is. Uh, but certainly looking for some, some input on that. And if anybody's got any more color, I'd love to hear it. Unless Rai is going to come on, I don't see more color happening. I'm not part of the TSC anymore because of the Ethereum calls. I don't think any of us are. So yeah. really, we would need to hear from from Rai or Hart. Okay. So maybe what we need to do then is uh, just have create an action item to follow up with Rai to to see what we can do about this. I think it's been kind of ad hoc. I, I had a, a couple of conversations with him about it, and it's it seems like this is being treated like a DIY, this, this is a problem that is being outsourced to the individual projects. Yeah, I think in in the, to your point, I think in, in the absence of rival probably won't make a lot of, a lot of headway with that. So I'll, I'll take a follow up item to discuss that with him. Um, release updates. Um, so we had planned a 23.4.0 RC1 that was gonna be delayed until after Chappella just so that we could prevent confusion with um, stakers and uh, node operators about what the correct version to run is for the Chappella fork. Um, what is planned to be in RC1 right now is RocksDB8, uh, the transaction pool layering um, and the work that Justin's been doing on Dagger uh, to start daggerizing um, the basic command and uh, metrics, I think is the first cut he's making with um, doing Dagger. Um, yeah, so we're still planning on delaying uh, until after Chappella for RC1. However, there's been a couple of issues that have cropped up in the last, since Friday, uh, that are hotfix worthy. Uh, so we're planning on a 23.1.3 hotfix release, and there's actually currently a hotfix release that's burning in right now that includes uh, this particular issue, um, a hotfix for execution payloads that come in and duplicate, but they have different validator indices. And that just that created a problem that resulted in uh, missed proposals for uh, 
Nimbus and Besu combinations in certain rare cases. Uh, but we've got a hotfix burning in for that. And tentatively, um, we're looking to do a add another hotfix to that release uh, to address an issue, a bonsai issue that's related to EIP 158. Uh, I think that that came up yesterday, Dano. I think I saw some activity from you on that. That the Diego had uncovered a problem with uh, with bonsai in certain certain situations. That was mostly clarifying if it was forced or and bonsai or just bonsai, because that would help us narrow down where to search for the bugs. Um, I mean, this is this is an issue for classic. It's not an issue for mainnet, but because classic is one of our supported networks, we should support it, however it looks. Yeah, I mean, this is if we if we do a full sync with Bonsai, then in the, right around the time of the the, the fork that included EIP one five eight, we actually get the same problem. If you're doing a full sync, is a full sync even possible now with the CL setup? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. It's just takes a really long time. It's not not. Well, I know it takes a long time, but how do you get your first head node? Um, you start with the full sync going forward as you normally would until you get to the merge block and then you uh, backward sync from wherever the CL uh, head is telling you is current. So it's kind of like a two part. When, when two I part run, full sync. it won't download any blocks until it hears back from the CL. Anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. So yeah, and in the normal sync strategy, that's how it's going to behave. But if you've specified full sync, it will it will actually forward sync until you get to merge. I'm actually running a node right now in that mode. Okay. It's been a long time since I've done full sync. Okay. Uh, Kareem, I think you, you put this PR PR up for, for this, right? You were able to identify that this uh, addressed the issue, at least with mainnet. Yeah, I, I just prefer to have this one uh, in the next release. And maybe we will see later if we really need to keep this one, uh, this optimization. I think Amazian. Uh, We'll check what will be the performance impact to revert this modification. I don't think it will be huge, uh, but uh, we need to check. And um, I check without and with this modification, and by reverting, the node was able to full sync again. So. Do you think the burn in will be sufficient for? quantifying any performance deltas or we want to do that separately, I guess. Uh, just add I, extra I, data points. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to, um, to, to to just do some performance testing on sync nodes because we I don't think it is um, necessarily like to, to sync from scratch snap sync or checkpoint sync. Um, as I have already some uh, sync nodes, uh, I'm going just to to check uh, if this uh, revert has a, a huge impact on performance. And um, yeah, so uh, basically, it uh, won't take a lot of time to to check. Uh, and I I don't maybe it's too late, but I just wanted to. No, what do you think to add also uh, the PR I shared on the chat? It's relating to a healing issue. Uh, so I did the fix because uh, sometimes we can have a, a huge number of uh, stack trace uh, when we have a heal. So the user need to have an inconsistency. Uh, but if the user had an inconsistency and the heal is triggered, uh, he can have a yeah, very bad log with a lot of stack trace and uh, the node will not be a, in a really good state during a log moment. So I did a fix to 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 fix that. And uh, I don't know what do you think to maybe push that in the 23.1.3. What Do you have the PR number off the top of your head or could you find it? Yeah, I, I shared that on the on the chat. It's a uh, ah, I see. Yeah, fifty two sixty six. I don't think it's already in a release because it was two weeks ago. So yeah. Okay. I see. So this is more of a cherry pick from uh, main. Yeah, 
it's it's a, it's a small modification, so it's, it will not be uh, too much to add. But uh, as you as you want, uh, honestly, I will prefer to have that. Yeah, I think we can probably discuss that on uh, on Discord to make sure that we have consensus there. I I think Simon might have, I'm guessing, putting words in his mouth, he might have some misgivings about adding additional scope to the hotfix specific to Chappella, but I'd rather let him voice his concerns. Yeah. I think I think both 5330 and 5226, 5266 both make good sense. So yeah, we can we can have that conversation on the contributors channel. Okay. I will put a message. Mm -hmm. So this is also the, the hotfix release tentatively we've talked about uh, like in uh, in show and tell on Chupa this morning, we discussed w whether what the value was of trying to get this out ahead of Chappella versus shortly you know, fast follow after Chappella. Um, I think the the consensus on Chupa was that this would be better as a fast follow rather than trying to rush a release and get communications out for um, what is probably a a ra fairly rare edge case that really only results in a missed proposal, not a consensus bug. I think 5330 might be more concerning. That would be more of a reason to, to push that quickly, but um, I still personally am of the opinion that this should be a fast follow. You have any thoughts on that, Daniel? It looks like the fix for 5330, which is the uh, classic bug, I think the yes. short term fix is to go back to 2210 whatever, because uh, it looks like the bug was introduced in January. Um, so I don't think we need to fast track it because there's no hot, there's no fork and 2210 whatever should be fine <laughs> for classic. So I'm okay decoupling 5330 from the 2313 in that regard. Um, and maybe we, I don't know, I'll let, let you guys decide, but maybe we publish it anyway and we just say, if you have Nimbus, upgrade everyone else. You don't have to. You think before or after Chappella? Um, <laughs> if we don't do it and someone misses a proposal on Chappella, it's bad for us if we know that the fix is out there. I mean, at least we should get maybe not a full fix, but we should have like a uh, P, uh, some build that they could switch to that we produced, even if we haven't validated it. I don't know. I mean, it's this is this is marketing questions. It's, yeah out of my pay grade but i think technically we probably should pull 5330 out of it because there's a viable solution that doesn't involve pushing a fix as quick as possible and i think uh the Chappelle upgrade puts in a different category than the, than the classic issue do you not think that uh, mainnet is is vulnerable to this particular issue because i think it's been cleared um They've run the contract and they've cleared all of it. I don't think it's vulnerable. I know there's some security issues that Martin's, uh, Martin or uh, I think Martin isn't disclosing yet until Classic finishes their state clearing because it's related to that. And he's, he's fairly confident. When I talked, when he mentioned it, he seemed fairly confident that it's not in mainnet. I mean, we could put it out there, but I don't, I don't see it being an issue because it's related to empty accounts from the Shanghai attacks. Okay, and that was that was my my quick take. Also, I wasn't I wasn't certain if this was specific to that account state and an out of gas situation, or just the just that account. You know, whether the out of gas could occur without having that specific account state and and leave leave this kind of problem state. But it, it does make sense that it would be specific to those particular accounts. I mean, maybe we do hot fix it, but the only the only failures we've seen have been on classic and on um, pre Byzantium mainnet. Right. Okay, I think 
we could probably uh, reiterate and uh, get consensus uh, on Discord asynchronously since uh, it doesn't seem like we want to rush a fix today. We've got time to reach consensus uh, across all the time zones. Um, that said, um, work updates. Um, Justin is not here today, but um, I can just kind of give a quick status on the inversion of control and up, uh, uh, decoupling uh, work he's doing with Dagger. I think I kind of spoke to that earlier that um, he is using uh, the metric system as a uh, uh, an incremental uh, target for uh, for daggerizing a lot of the, the configuration that comes through basic command. And he's got a PR up for that, which I don't have at my fingertips, um, but I'll add that to the notes here. Uh, so that's coming along nicely and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clean. So um, on the Postman docs site, um, there really hasn't been a lot of interest. Nobody really seems to be that concerned about the Postman docs site being down. Uh, I still need to talk with uh, our docs team about uh, using the same publishing uh, mechanism as Teku. And then um, Mega EOF. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things I mentioned in, in the uh, Discord is I'm going to be creating a long live branch that is just the Mega EOF stuff um, intended to be kept very well synced with main. Um, the reason I want to do a separate branch rather than doing feature flags is what's in EOF is still changing. It's uh, I felt better putting in when it was targeted at Shanghai and it had a fixed set of EIPs, but since it got pulled out, um, the set of EIPs and the content of those EIPs have not been fixed. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to merge into main when I know that there are changes being discussed, but at the same time, um, there's desire to get all the different clients together and get them working together so we can test and validate some of these these questions. There still might be more opcodes being added. There might be opcodes being removed. Um, so it's it's not in a final state. Um, you know, it's probably about as final as four eight four four is. Um, maybe a little less so. Um, but just on, in that regard, because it's volatile, I don't want to put it in and have it move around and have different versions and apply that it's ready when the the EIPs haven't been closed and and a bow put on it. Um, right now, the target is um, optimistically Cancun, pessimistically Prague as the lead in Prague. And Cancun being the uh, the second half 2023 release and Prague being the first half 2024 release. So. Cool. That's, that's a good timeline if we keep it. Um, I would like to go back to 2340RC1. Is there still room for larger uh, destabilizing changes in there? Yes, definitely. We were actually um, a little concerned that we didn't have uh, enough to, to really warrant a, a release candidate series. So I have some new EVM fixes that I'd like to put in there. Um, this is the right broad base. I'm getting rid of the UN256 and the operations. I'm not. I might go as far as pulling it out of the um, storage APIs, but not necessarily implementation. I've seen the performance measurements on that not quite as good, which is kind of interesting. But as far as removing UN256 from internal operations and moving over to the Java 17 uh, switch statement, I've seen anywhere from you know 20 to 40 percent um, all in, and in some cases I've got like you know 400 percent increase on some operations. So. I'll get that PR ready and post my supporting docs for that too. Awesome. Um, any any other work updates? Fabio, would you do you want to discuss the uh, layered transaction full work? Yes. Yes, this is for a candidate for the RC. The main goal is to be able to better manage uh, gaps in the transaction pool. By gaps, I mean uh, 
when a sender has more than one transaction and uh, the transaction could not be sequential by nouns. Uh, this could happen because of the broadcast of the transaction. They could not arrive in order or could also be a kind of a, a spam attack in order to pollute the transaction. Actually, this could also happen with only one transaction if the uh, transaction by the sender is not the expected one for that account. Uh, so the current implementation uh, has some limits, uh, handling gaps in the transactions. So uh, the new uh, idea was to create different layer for transaction, uh, having the most, uh, having a difference, first of all, between transactions that are executable, so they could, in theory, go into a next block, so they have the right uh, nonce for the sender, and uh, then uh, put the transaction that are not executable, so in terms of nodes in a separate uh, layer in the memory. Uh, and starting with this, uh, so I also um, created a special first layer where we keep the transaction ordered by uh, active uh, priority fee. Uh, and this layer is very uh, small and limited by number of transactions. Uh, 2000, there should be enough to fit any mainnet block with the current gas limit. Uh, then after that, the other layer are limited by size. This is also uh, something relevant for 4844, so we can have uh, uh, an amount of transaction, uh, so a transaction pool that is also uh, limited by memory consumption. And the, so I tried to explain uh, better in the, uh, PR, uh, where I also reported the test that they have done, uh, testing block creation in the current transaction pool versus the layer transaction pool. The results are good. Uh, in uh, average, uh, blocks have 12% uh, uh, more transactions the new uh, layer transaction pool. Um, it is also possible to scale to 100,000 transactions with the new pool easily because as I said before, uh, since transactions are split across different layer in terms of uh, their priority, the Every layer has its own uh, ordering, and uh, only the first layer, the prioritized transaction layer, is uh, every transaction is ordered. Uh, while, while in the following layer, only the first transaction of the of a sender is ordered. So, in order to avoid to uh, sort. Uh, 100,000 of transactions each time. Uh, the idea is also to make this uh, uh, extensible. Uh, it could be possible, for example, to add another layer that uh, persists on disk if we want to, uh, or specific layer that handle blob transaction in a special way.
Um, I also added a lot of more metrics in the transaction pool uh, and built a preview, a Grafana dashboard preview to uh, make use of those new metrics. Uh, the important thing is that is experimental and is only uh, can only be enabled on demand using uh, Flag. Mm, yes, well, I for for more information, please refer to the PR and and or ask question or make direct. Yeah, that's that's pretty exciting that we could uh, support a hundred thousand transaction deep pool without significant uh, overhead. Yeah, the, um, the time uh, in terms of uh, block creation uh, is better. Uh, I, I forgot to say that it's better, uh, probably because uh, the number of transactions that we always sort is uh, 2,000 instead of 4,000 by default uh, of the current implementation. <clears throat> Sorry, that I was muted. Um, does anybody have any other work updates or anything they want to talk about? Um, I, I can talk quickly. Uh, so I'm currently trying to to, to fill the, the flat database after the step sync and also fasting, but fasting is duplicated. So I'm trying to do that. Uh, I started a PR and uh, we are currently testing on on Girly and maybe uh, soon on mainnet. So just to share that, yes, we are working on that. We are hoping that uh, this modification will, if it's working, uh, it will improve the performance because we do not have to keep the fallback uh, mechanism anymore to read the tree when something is missing in the flood database. That'll be great. I noticed on uh, other business, I, I think this might have been from Simon originally, um, that there's a proposal that we re replace the quarterly and bi-weekly with monthly releases, a monthly release, release cadence. Has anybody had a chance to review this? Uh, looks like Dano might have had some feedback already. That was on Discord. We just need a deprecation process if we change it. OK. So is, is the proposal basically that uh, we don't do quarterly uh, large breaking change releases because month. I don't think monthly would we'd be. I doubt we would be able to do a monthly like breaking release every month. It sounds like espousing like a Teku style, uh, just release on a Calver cadence without having uh, release candidates, quarterly release candidates for breaking changes? So for a bit of color, um, Hyperledger initially required everyone to be on Semver, which was a total pain in the neck um, because they say that, you know, they're supposed to enforce backwards compatibility, but everyone always had broken stuff. Unless you're gonna mechanically enforce Calver and break APIs when mechanical check the APIs that you declare as public change, then it's it's marketing speak anyway. Um, Calver also solved an important problem with calling it BASU 2.0 when E2.0 is being developed. Um, but one of the things that the other members of the TSC were concerned about was figuring out when major incompatibilities might start coming in. So the uh, you know quarterly didn't seem like too frequently, and having the the Calver be done on quarterly numbers um, solved that problem. Um, by a number. Um, I think some of the people on the TSC that cared a lot about that aren't on the TSC anymore. Um, it wasn't me, it was some of the other fabric people that 
doing their fabric things. Um, so if we change it, you know, there's there's a risk that the TSC might come back and ask for deprecation policy or to get some formal, um, you know, how do you communicate that this might include a breaking change at some point, other than saying every release could break you, which is not necessarily a good situation. Um, so that's you know the only the only thing to be careful of if you go forth with that is to um, have a plan in case the TSC asks these questions and have to know what's in place. Other than that, I really don't have any opinion on to what should be done. What do we think the benefit is going to be? Of, I mean, so, Simon's not here to defend the proposal, but uh, the benefit of a uh, a non-quarterly of Calver release, what do we think that would be? We're not tied to a schedule. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we're not that tied to a schedule currently, but yeah, that's it is more flexible. Because one of the concerns you brought was, is it worth doing an RC release in this? Um, so they didn't. I mean, maybe we keep with the patches and we just don't bump the month number. We don't do breaking changes more than four times a year. And if we're just doing minor feature ads, we keep the first two numbers the same and just bump it so it's not truly you know, a release date version number. But every time that you break things, you bump the caliber parts of it. I mean, that's another option. But um, whatever Simon wants to do with it, if he wants to go to battle and push for it, I'm not going to stop him. But these are the things that we need to worry about is um, how are we going to communicate to users reliably that, by the way, stuff's going to break if you upgrade this version. Anybody else have a strong opinion one way or the other? Maybe we can uh, have the same conversation in the APAC call where uh, Simon would be on and he could uh, make his case. So Next APAC can... calls canceled because of an Australian holiday. Oof. Sounds like we take it to Discord. <laughs> I'll, I think I'll go on record as saying it seems a bit like a deck chair rearranging. I, I don't I don't see a lot of value coming from this amount of change. I, I do kind of like having a a, a a breaking change quarterly where there's, there's already an, an inbuilt expectation that things might break between quarterly releases. So from my perspective, I I don't think the current process is is broken in a way that needs to be fixed. And and I just moving to Calver doesn't seem like it's going to bring us anything except the work to change that. It's my personal opinion. Well, that said, doesn't sound like anybody else has any feedback. Maybe we can just take this to Discord. Uh, metrics review, I think this is a cut and paste from the last quarterly. If you want to review the, the metrics, I guess we can look at that. Contributor strength has increased by 321% and is still on its way up. Do we know how we are quantifying contributor strength? I have no idea how that's measured. The charts look nice. The real, this was a, more of an issue two years ago. The real value in this comes to comparing it with the other Hyperledger projects. Mm -hmm. And that was when they were debating whether or not to deprecate some projects or not. 
And I think they've come basically to a, to a good place on the TSC. Um, some stuff like uh, uh, Burrow's been deprecated, um, Quilt's been deprecated, a couple of the struggling projects have been deprecated. Um, so they're, they're, they're end of life now. Um, this is getting them the ammunition they need to, to have a discussion with Sawtooth about um, what's your future in Hyperledger compared to the other ones. Um, the strongest projects are Besu, Fabric, and the Identity projects. And the Identity projects are really the, uh, the dark horse, the, the stealth project. There's a lot of attention there going on in there that's not, you know, gone big and majorly public yet. So, but this is, the numbers are hard to explain, but when you can see them relative to the other ones, it confirms and denies hypotheses they have in dealing with other projects at the, at the TSC level. Okay. I think I lost where, there we go. Um, roadmap review, I think we can skip that. Um, does anybody else have anything um, open forum? Well, we can give back 20 minutes and be done a little early if nobody has uh, anything else that they want to discuss. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you on Discord. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, bye.